In your book, you talk about those years and how you go from playing with Scream in DC yeah. to suddenly you're in a big band and your relationship with this punk rock world yeah. is changing. Um, you're conditioned to reject anything, uh, any conformity, any sort of uh, you know f popularity or right. whatever it is. Nirvana came from that same scene, but there was a, there was a problem is that Kurt's songs were so fucking good <laughs> that it's like, you know, we never expected that we would become as big as we did, but it was almost inevitable with his songs and his right. lyrics and his voice, you know? Was there any trepidation? Or were you guys just like, this is amazing, let's do it? There was once when we were meeting with all the record companies in New York, mm. long before anybody really knew who Nirvana was, and we were in the office of this guy named Donnie Einer, and he goes, well, what do you guys want? And Kurt goes, we want to be the biggest band in the world. <laughs> and I thought he was fucking kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever second guess yourself and wonder whether this was what you actually wanted to do? So after Kurt died and the band was over, uh, I did a bunch of soul searching and I actually, I decided, okay, I'm gonna disappear. I'm gonna go to the most remote place on earth. I'm just gonna get away from everything and figure it out. Right. So I went to the Ring of Kerry in Ireland where I'd been before. It's so beautiful there. And it re you really feel like you're just at the end of the earth and there's nothing it's so fucking serene and it's so beautiful. And I was driving around in my rental car and on a country road and I saw this hitchhiker kid and I thought, well, maybe I'll pick him up. And as I got closer to him, I saw that he had a Kurt Cobain t-shirt on. Mm. And, I, and it was Kurt's face looking back at me Jesus. in the middle of nowhere. And I realized like, oh, I'm, I can't outrun this. Mm. So I need to go home and fucking get back to work. And so I did. I went back and I started recording these songs by myself. Um, and with, really just with the intention of just continuing life. Um, that's what I needed to do to survive. And it, and it helped a lot. When did you realize like, oh, these songs that I was kind of maybe nervous to share, like people really like them. So I went, I recorded the first record by myself in like six days. And I made a hundred cassettes. Cassettes. And I was so fucking stoked that I could go to this cassette duplication place and like, I designed the insert. <laughs> like, I picked the font. Did you give yourself credit in the liner notes? Unfortunately, my name is nowhere in that fucking thing <laughs> at all. I called, I called it Foo Fighters because I didn't want people to know it was me. Hmm. Because of the baggage that right. came with that. And then, some, and then someone from a record company called and said, hey, we want to put out your record. I'm like, the cassette thing? <laughs> okay, well, well, all right. I had offers to go play drums with other bands. A singer-songwriter named Tom Petty. Yes, I, went, I played with him on Saturday Night Live and then um, was asked if I would uh, consider joining the band. And 11-year-old you is like, hell yes. Oh, dude. I, I was flipping out, but it, I, I got the call to play with Tom while I was in the studio recording the first Foo Fighters thing. Hmm. And so it was a crossroads. You know, it was like, okay, should I do something that I know I can do, or should I do something that I don't know that I could do? And I decided to do the thing that I, that I was unsure, that, that was a challenge. Right. <clears throat> I'd never been the singer of a band before. Well, I never, I played guitar, but like, I was, so I was afraid to do it, and that's why I did it. But it's also more spotlight, right? I can, you can imagine a different version of your life story where you're like, you're just the guy behind the drums for Tom yeah. Petty or whoever, and you're a working musician, as opposed to the guy in the center of the stage with the spotlight on you and a guitar singing the songs, and yeah. the whole stadium is singing along. Well, I was kind of born with a drummer mentality, hmm. which is um, just like keep the beat, and keep the people moving. Right. And um, it's a comfortable place to be. And I still, to this day, love being the drummer. Like, if I go to, to, like, to go record with someone, I don't walk in there like, I'm Dave Grohl, I'm gonna fucking play like this. I walk in and I'm like, what do you need? Tell me what you want me to do. And I like that. Mm. Like, I like facilitating someone else's boogie, 
you know? It's fun, it's cool. As a front man, dude, it took me for fucking ever to get comfortable with doing that. Hmm. A decade at least. Now it's great. I walk out on stage and I'm like, <laughs> come on, motherfucker! So, like, yeah! so many books about music, books by musicians, make it seem so complicated and so difficult to live this life of a creative person. And I'm sure in a lot of ways it is, but one of the things I loved about your book is that it captures the simple joy of it. Well, shouldn't it be? Hmm. I mean, I can only speak for myself. I just feel really grateful that I can be here. And the reason why I'm here is because I play music. It's such a, to me, that's very simple. I never thought it would happen this way, but I really appreciate all of the shit that comes with it. Hmm. A lot. I had money to like eat. I'm like, oh shit. And then I like bought my mom's house. I was like, yeah. <laughs> then I gave her a fucking car with a bow on it for Christmas. The whole fucking deal. I can't, I can't believe that that kind of stuff happened. And then also to you know, travel the world and have these incredible experiences with my, and then meet all of these people that I consider my heroes. I don't take one fucking moment for granted. I think it's really cool.